what I think is the 15th season of CEO Connect. Uh, we started upstairs in that little room in Zingerman's Deli. Uh, and I don't know if anybody in the room was there. Maybe Steve was. Steve, were, Steve was, uh, we let him in as a, we had a child children's pass to get into that event. And uh, we've been going ever since. We had about, I think, 20 people at the first event. And this year we, we were over 70 signed up for today. So we may have uh, some standing room. And I'm very excited to, uh, to get to the topic. Uh, which is good to great in the social sectors uh, because it's something that I think most everybody in this room is very dedicated to, the idea that we are all one, we are all connected, and we are only as strong as our weakest members in the community so that if we, uh, we don't pay attention to taking care of uh, people who have special needs, uh, we are weakening ourselves and we are missing out on what it's all about to be a human being. So we're really excited about uh, this topic and we want to get into it uh, as quickly as possible. I do want to uh, just introduce, do we have any people that have not been here before? Okay, so a handful of people, welcome. And uh, we would uh, very much, uh, normally if we, we have time, we will introduce everybody, but we don't have that time today because of the uh, packed uh, agenda. So, but I do have uh, some time that I want to be sure to make some uh, special announcements because some cool things are going on in the community. Some people are moving into new positions, and uh, at this point, probably everybody, people are saying, "Oh, this must be about me, right?" <laughs> <laughs> or not. Uh, so I'd like to have an opportunity, as we usually do, this is CEO Connect, so there's an opportunity, I think, for people to talk about cool things, and I'm aware of a few things that I just want to share, and uh, and then if there are other announcements that people want to make, we'll, we'll just take a few minutes for that. Uh, first of all, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Robert Pasek, and I am the uh, host and founder of CEO Connect, and it's a project that we've been working with United Bank, Todd and I did this similar presentation for 10 years ago. Yeah, and we've been working beyond that. So it's going to be much better. Yeah, it's better. And essentially, at that point, we were doing it because there we felt we were at a point of really great need in this community. And that was 10 years ago, and then five years before 2008. So you never know what's, what's coming around the bend. And right now, we seem to be hitting a little bit area of prosperity. Um, but that's one of our sponsors, United Bank. Uh, Zingerman's Community of Businesses is another sponsor, and we want to thank uh, United Bank provides all the great food. Zingerman's provides the uh, wonderful venues for this. Uh, Roger Rail is another sponsor. Roger is a uh, serial innovator. Uh, what's the term you use, Roger? Uh, I'm a venture catalyst. Venture catalyst. <laughs> yeah, venture catalyst. Yeah, I don't have the money, but I have the ideas. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And, uh, and what I do is provide executive coaching for individuals, teams, and I've been doing a lot of really fascinating things lately on career coaching, uh, helping people make transitions, uh, whether it's young people who are just leaving the university and starting out on trying to decide whether to be entrepreneurs or going to business, people in mid-career who realize that maybe they're not doing fully what they want to do, or uh, people who are at, uh, I guess they call the fourth quarter of career and are not ready to retire, whatever the hell that means, but are looking for new opportunities. So. Uh, if any of you are interested, I, I would love to talk to you about the programs I'm doing. And there's several people in the room that I've worked with. Many of you are uh, former clients, current clients, friends. So it's a really cool thing to be here. And I, I appreciate all of your uh, great wishes that I survived my ride on, my el on the elephant in Thailand. Uh, I was telling Ray that uh, I went to visit my son and his significant other who are living in Thailand, and they said, oh, we'll take this little elephant ride. And I thought, oh, it'd be great, you know, if you like at the, the carnival where they, you know, you ride around and the, the guy holds the elephant by the reins. No, no, this was a whole, like, in the wild, in the jungle in Thailand, uh, and we, we had to feed elephants. 
they do eat el uh, they do eat um, uh, bananas, but they eat them bunches at a time. Just like shove them in their mouth and they eat four or five bananas, and they don't even bother to peel them. <laughs> they were riding up the mountain and it's pouring out, it's torrential down right, and, and I'm looking and there's nothing to hold on to on so you are just on the elephant and it's wet and I'm holding on for dear life to you know the elephant's ears, whatever I could grab. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, you know, I could die very easy. I could eat the elephant could trip or I could fall off this. Then I thought, what a great story. <laughs> I could tell it a CEO I died on an elephant. Died on an elephant. <laughs> how much better does it get than that? Hey, so how how bad is a wet elephant smell? <laughs> <laughs> well that's the other thing you have to you have to, you have to wash the elephants. So we go to this uh, pond, and you get in the water with the elephants. And the elephants love to defecate when you're in the pond. So you're walking around and like, oh my god, I cannot believe that I'm here, you know? Like, all the things you've learned about cleanliness, like, forget about it. Uh, so that was, yeah, so that, they don't smell too bad. But anyway, a couple of announcements I want to make. First of all, uh, Many of you have uh, read about this, but um, one of our stalwarts, one of our presenters at CEO Connect, Marvin Parnes, um, has been given a, a grant and a new job. And it's a very exciting job at a, one of our most prestigious institutes in the world, really, the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. And Marvin is now the managing uh, director of that. So let's give Marvin. had a great month because uh, Nelson married his daughter off last week and it was sunshiny and beautiful. So that's one of the great things. And then uh, Bill Brinkerhoff, uh, you've had, a, had some interesting work with your company. You want to say a little bit what sale of uh, your, the company and what's happened with that? That was a, in the spring. But. Yeah, uh, uh, stand up, Bill. <laughs> Bill Brinkerhoff, serial entrepreneur, I guess I could call him. Uh, company Alpha Quarter uh, uh, Pharma that is developing a, a, a drug for cardiovascular disease. And uh, the, drug, the company was acquired by AstraZeneca at the end of March. And uh, we're just kind of completing the tech transfer, but they're really investing a ton in the program. And it's going to be a kind of a whole program that was kind of conceived and brought forward in Ann Arbor um, that's now going to be funded for global development. Uh, so we're, we're happy about that exit. Fantastic. We were part of the Asperion um, company, the original sale of that, and that has now gone back public again, I guess, and they have raised money, and uh, Roger Newton uh, will be speaking at the CEO Connect event in the winter. So Bill's been part of some pretty interesting stuff and a uh, very interesting entrepreneur. Uh, there are many, many other things. I just wanted to highlight one thing that's going to go on tonight in town, and it connects to a few people, Patricia Garcia. And maybe, Patricia, you can tell us what's going on because you can do better. But it's through Ken Fisher's program. Ken Fisher's always popping up about how great he is, but we want to hear it. <laughs> Patricia, you know, so, so Patricia, can you just tell us what's going on and what your connection is to it? Sure. Let me well, pass this back to you. Well, I have to think Ken Fisher's pretty great too. <laughs> but may, maybe not for the same reasons that you think he's great. He, brought, he picked my daughter up at the airport last oh, night. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter Maya is a dancer, choreographer, director in New York City and organic magnetics, which is and she is here to dance and perform with the UMS season opener, Fat Swaller, which will be held at Downtown Home and Garden. Very different venue for UMS, but it's very exciting. It's sold out, I'm sorry to say, but um, some, sometimes season ticket holders will turn tickets in at the last minute. So I'm thinking it's an outdoor venue, so people like to stand outside and probably can still it's dance. It's going to be such think. a cool event. Yeah. So call the ticket office if, if you are interested in going and see if somebody's turned in their tickets. Um, Ken, do you want to share anything? Uh, this is our opening event, but next uh, Sunday, the 15th, Audra McDonald is going to be here, and uh, we have 3,600 seats in, in Hill Auditorium, and we still have some left, so uh, that's going to be a great evening. 
And one of the things that will happen there is it'll be a pretty much an all Gershwin evening. And at the concert, uh, the Gershwin family will be there to announce a new relationship between their family and our School of Music, Theater, and Dance. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's very exciting for uh, for the university. Thank you, Ken. I, I, I have a recording of Audrey McDonald doing uh, Bess, Horthy and Bess, just recently. It's unbelievable. I mean, to make your tears flow and heart stop, so it's really great. Well, we want to get on with the program, and um, we, we, you'll see there's some other great programs coming up. Later this month, we have a very special program, Cheryl Choden, who uh, I know is Cheryl Eater, and I'll tell you why I know her that way, but she will be presenting at the end of the month on the 27th, Rachel? 26th, okay. Uh, three weeks from today, Cheryl was for 30 years the beat reporter for Channel 7. Uh, and so you've seen her covering unbelievable stories over the years before that. She was a radio journalist. And she'll be sharing stories about uh, her work, but also she'll be talking about how to deal with the media. So for people who are interviewed, uh, will be on television, she'll be giving some tips about do's and don'ts about how to deal with, uh, with the media. When, uh, when Channel 7 Action News shows up at your uh, room. As a matter of fact, uh, we need some help here because uh, Rachel's getting married in, uh, in October and the uh, woman who is making her dresses has not come through with any dresses. And this is in Milan, so we're going to try to get action news on it. If any of you know, uh, if any of you know how to put a little pressure on uh, Wedding dress maker, talk to Rachel. Uh, did I get this right? Yeah. Yeah. Six other wedding parties are also affected. So this is a tragedy of the big biggest baby. I said TJ Maxx, but she said. Yeah. So I'm going to um, turn those over to Todd, who's going to frame um, this talk today. And I just wanted to briefly introduce our other members of the, the school. What we're trying to do here is present this idea of good to great in a very brief manner, but then stimulate a conversation among all of you, many of you whom are either directors of agencies or are serving on boards uh, or serving in other ways, to think about what we can do to um, make our great social, our good social service even better. I'd say it's great, let's make it even greater. So in addition to Todd, Dr. Rose Malanka, who is the uh, president of Washtenaw Community College, and Neil Hajara, and he is at the Ann Arbor Community Foundation, and um, then we have Pam Smith, who is the executive director of the United Way, and most everybody knows these folks. And so they're going to each talk about social sectors from their perspective. Uh, but first, I'm going to bring up Todd Clark, who is the president of United Bank. Did I get the title right now? Yeah, okay. And uh, Todd has been newly uh, appointed to his position, so it's a very exciting change for him. And uh, that's why he looks so relaxed and comfortable. <laughs> Chad, you want to give us a framework? Sure. Thanks, Rob. Um, so, oh, you can hear me? Okay. So, yeah, so my day job is with United Bank and Trust, uh, but I also wear a number of other hats in the community. Um, so, I'm currently the vice chair of the United Way board, so I get an interesting perspective with that role. I chair the United Way's Community Investment Committee, so I work with Neil really closely and, and Pam in, in two regards. I'm also the past chair of SOS Community Services, so I also see it directly from, from an agency, you know, dealing with consumers firsthand. And I'm also lucky enough to dabble in the healthcare industry because I'm board chair of Chelsea Community Hospital. So it's, it's, it's a, it is a fascinating community. And it's interesting, so when Rob and I did this 10 years ago, um, it, it, it's, it's, it is amazing to look back 10 years and look at how much change, how much has changed. But I promise you, going forward, the pace and the amount and the kind of change that the social sector is going through is gonna make the last 10 years look like, really, we've been standing still. I, I really believe that. 
there, you know, there's a number of challenges, but with challenges, there also come a number of opportunities. You know, the pace of change is no longer evolutionary. Uh, I'm not even sure it's transformational anymore. I, I, I think it's, I, I think it's going to be uh, revolutionary, and and I'll, and I'll tell you why. Um, you know, funding sources are more scarce. Demand is higher. Even even in a community like Washtenaw. Which, which, if you look at us relative to, to any of our county neighbors, we're, we are also fortunate to be here. But it is amazing how many people in need there are there there are in this community. So, uh, so looking at this from an agency's perspective, um, at least my perspective on it, there's a lot of inward focus right now within within every agency I seem to to, to come across. Um, funding is always is always scarce. Funding is always a high priority. How do we find more funding? But I think a lot of the agencies are also doing some serious evaluation of their missions and their business models because so much is changing. Uh, strategic planning is also, I mean, every agency, everybody here does it, but I think the premium on good quality strategic planning is really, really high because the strategic plan has to lead to actionable plans that, that, that result in change and improve collaboration. And, and I think you're gonna hear a lot about how much collaboration is starting to go on in the community in, in really healthy ways, but, but I'm not even sure we've, we've, we've really seen anything yet. So these strategic plans really start to involve many other constituents that I don't think they have in the past. Agencies are trying to figure out what they can be best in the world at, and that comes right out of, out of good to great. Um, but again, if you add a complexity, what, what, what can my agency be the best in the world at that also aligns with community need and the required impact in the community. So those are a couple other dimensions that, that really change the way that I think our agencies need to look at their business models. Because you could be the best in the world at something, but, it, it, but if it doesn't align with the community, and if it doesn't provide the desired impact, um, it's, you're, it, it's, it's great, but you're not gonna be sustainable. Um, there's a lot of resource reallocation. There's a lot of optimization going on within within all of our agencies, which creates a, a, a pretty big risk. Coworker retention in these agencies, I think, is becoming more and more of a challenge. And so is volunteer retention. You know, so many of our agencies count on volunteers. And, and if you look at if you look at the average agency in Washington County and the amount of work that they all count on volunteers for, as missions start to change, as business models start to change, you really need to educate those volunteers so that they can continue to be engaged. But that's a risk, and, and, and we've seen some fallout in different situations. So. To kind of follow up on all the internal focus that's going on, and I'm sorry about the sunlight, but I didn't see a cloud in the sky this morning. It was beautiful this morning. You can see a lot of stars. Yeah, it's 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 you took care of it. That was amazing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Scary. But but with all with with all of the internal focus that's going on. Um, the one thing that, that none of us can lose sight of is at the end of the day, we're all working so hard to benefit these consumers. And it's fair, I've, I've seen it when you're in the boardroom, you know, when you're working with staff and you're dealing with, with all of these issues, it, it's amazing. You can actually forget about the consumer and why you're there. And, 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 and I don't think, I mean, you can't, but it happens. I mean, it, it they, you know, they do creep out of your consciousness and we, we cannot allow that to happen. On the external side, there is a lot more coordinated funding efforts going on. Um, and, and we are continuing to transition to more outcome-based uh, results. And, and, and the outcomes are being determined 
um, through collaboration. So it's so it's no longer you know an agency can can write a grant and and say this is you know these are the outcomes we promise. That still has to happen, but that also has to align with the greater community's desired outcomes because the funding models are becoming much more collaborative, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about that as we as we get down the line. But what do funders want today? I, in my opinion, I think funders want a laser light focus on on key areas of need again through community alignment and community impact and and that's a that's a difficult thing uh, i'll give you an example sos is, a, is an organization i think we're celebrating our 42nd year uh, in existence and and sos has evolved so much over the last 42 years but what's happened with sos is we've had some great executive directors in the past who are great grant writers and, and when they would see funding available, they would develop a program so that they could go get that funding. And so you do that year after year after year, and in 40 years, you end up with a pretty darn complicated business model um, that, you know, how does it align? What, you know, what, what should we be doing? What should we hand off to other agencies? That's an excruciating process for, our, for an organization to go through. But it is happening, um, and, and and the funders want these services to be delivered in the most efficient way possible, the absolute most efficient way possible. So there's a lot of pressure because they want to maximize their return on investment. Uh, the last thing, the last thing I'll talk about is the fact that all these businesses are becoming more and more data driven. And that's a big change, and, and that's a big deal. First, you've got to you've got to make sure you're capturing the right data. Because remember, I talked about outcomes. You've got to be able to capture the appropriate data. You've got to be able to report the appropriate data, and it's got to line up with the other agencies that operate within your space. Again, because you're reporting up to, you know, more of a collaborative funding group. And so you've got a lot of these social workers, you know, MSWs, that they, you know, they weren't necessarily trained to be experts on managing and reporting data. So that is a huge change that I see the agencies going through. And it's tough. I mean, it is tough. But with all that said, um, I, I, I think this is a tremendous community, and, and, and Neil and Pam will talk about you know, how much smarter I think we as a community are approaching all of our consumers in need. And we will try things, we'll try many things. Some things are gonna work super. Some things we try won't work. And, and that's, that's okay. We've just gotta continue to keep, to keep after it um, because we, you know, we can't let up or you know, we'll see our problems in this community, and Rob's right. I mean, we're no stronger than our weakest link. And I think everybody in this room um, is has been pretty fortunate, um, has a good situation, and I think we owe it to our community to give our, give our time, talent, and treasures back. So I also just want to thank everybody for all the, for all the hard work that, that you do. It is, it's tough stuff. Um, so I will hand it back to Rob. And <coughs> Thanks, Todd. Uh, I want to uh, run through briefly the, the handout here and talk about uh, this wonderful uh, manuscript uh, that Jim Collins and his colleagues have put together about Good to Great and the Social Sector. How many of you have read the the pamphlet? Okay, uh, about half. Of God. I would really encourage you. To read it, it, it's a very quick read. Uh, it's about 30 pages, and it it pulls out the key principles from the book Good to Great, which I still think, after 15 years out, is about the best book out there on uh, strategic planning, on uh, what it takes to make an organization work. It also applies well to individuals, which we can talk about. Uh, so, what is the, the principles of Good to Great? Well, the idea is this flywheel that it, it's it's tough to get something going. Uh, once you get it going and it begins to move, it, it's an easier concept to keep it going. Uh, although in th these days, I think sometimes 
Uh, you can imagine a flywheel that keeps hitting these bumps on the road. And sometimes it's not just a real road, but it's bumps on the internet or bumps in telecom or whatever, but uh, this disruptive bumps that we, we talk about. Uh, so we're flying along and then something comes along that completely trumps our business. Uh, we've all seen uh, how difficult it is, for example, in the, uh, the world of uh, newspapers and what's been going on in the community, uh, not just our community, but other communities. They're flying along for hundreds of years and all of a sudden things begin to hit and, and disrupt that whole industry. I think, uh, Rose, you might touch on this, but it's happening in higher education now with uh, online education all of a sudden being a tremendous disruptive force uh, to what we've had as a, as a steady stream of, in higher ed, and one industry after another. And I think one of the disruptive things uh, that have hit the social sectors uh, is the fact that a lot of businesses in this community uh, are not really in the community, the people are not doing business in the community. For example, when you're talking about Alphacore, your customers are not in our and many of you work in organizations where your customers are all across the world. And so your, your workers are less inclined to get involved in the community activities. Banks, a little bit different. Your, your, your work is, especially United, which is one of the, I have two local banks, two local banks, three maybe? Two. Two, okay, two. <laughs> in, in Ann Arbor, and uh, I think United is, is uh, distinguished by how involved uh, their workers are. It's, it's part of the mission. But many other companies in Ann Arbor, that's not part of the mission. I mean, for example, Google, which is a, a big force in the community, we don't hear that much about, but they don't really get involved uh, behind organizations. I don't want to badmouth Google because their young people do get involved, but it's up to them what they get involved in. It's not really targeted. And a lot of it has to do with the things that they're interested in, as, as is true. So anyway, what does it take to go from good to great? Uh, disciplined people. And they, one of the great concepts here is the idea of level five leadership. And level five leadership, the best way I can think about it is, when you look in the, when you're a leader, and something great happens, and what do you do? Do you look out the window? Uh, and, and look at the people that contributed and say, this is all about you, uh, thank you for, for your, your activity, it was, it was a team effort. Or you look in the mirror and say, oh how pretty I am and how wonderful I am. Uh, and it's all, you know, it, it's me. I, I could go do this again, I, I could drop this and just start another enterprise. Not true. Uh, and on the other hand, when there's a mistake, a level five leader uh, does look in the mirror and says, what did I do wrong? And when there is a uh, success, they look out. So it's vice versa. If, if that's the idea, it's humility. It's, it's leaders who are humble and who are not going to take all the credit for everything they have. It's kind of the opposite of what you think of as charismatic leaders, who take all the credit. Uh, the other part of, uh, would be great that I, I really love and work with a lot on companies is it's about first who, then what. Get the best people on the bus. Don't worry about where you're going and then hire for where you're going. Get great people around you. And if you have great people around you, great things will happen. Because you'll, you'll never know where they're going to contribute, but they'll drive your company. And I've seen this over and over again in companies where they really hire for talent, they hire for uh, moral and ethical reasons, they get the right people that they don't have to worry about, that, that are not going to be dishonest, and those people uh, drive greatness in the company. Uh, I'm seeing this right now, I've uh, got a new assistant, Rachel Matson, and she's just adding tremendous value. I have a very small team, but uh, getting the right people takes my business in directions that I hadn't really thought of before, and it's really what matters. Stephanie, you know, you've been doing that for over 30 years in your company, Tech Ed, right? And uh, it's, it's all about the people. Yeah, okay. Stephanie Rosenbaum has run Tech Ed for over 40 years? I so, started it when I was two. <laughs> she and Chuck Newman are battling for the, the longest standing entrepreneurs in the room, I think, right now. So, uh, 
It's all about the people. And then the next part is confronting the brutal facts and the hedgehog concept. This has been thought. Confronting the brutal facts is just what it says. Don't be pie in the sky. Don't say, oh, everything's wonderful. It's going to get better tomorrow. And the best story about that is from uh, General Stockton, or Admiral Stockton. Admiral. Uh, at, he was a, uh, Admiral, and he was a, uh, Get Google. Well, yeah, he, he, he was a uh, prisoner of war in uh, Hanoi and, and was captain. And I just was in Vietnam and it was unbelievable. I visited the tunnels and the war, rec, rec, uh, the, uh, war remnants museum and, and it's unbelievable what happened to that country. We don't think about what that country, uh, but Stockton, without getting off, what Stockton kept saying is that uh, the people who survived the camps were the people, not that kept saying, we're going to be rescued, they're coming on Friday, we know that they're coming to get us. Those people that had extreme optimism <coughs> were the ones that struggled the most. The ones that faced the brutal facts, like, look, we're here, the war's going to be over someday, we're going to survive, we don't know when it's going to be, but what are the facts? How do we survive? Not holding out, you know, God will, serve, God will bring us uh, out on Friday or whatever. So those kinds of uh, facing the facts and not being in denial, essentially, is, is another characteristic of companies that go from good to great. The hedgehog concept, very simple. Uh, what are you, it's actually kind of on the other side of this, what are you passionate about? What are, what are your unique talents? Uh, what are your values? And then what's your financial engine? Uh, I, that, the one on the back is a little bit different, but it's that basic concept of strategic planning about knowing what are you all about as an organization. Not what do you want to be, but what are you? What are your cores? What are you great at? Those people that you brought together, what unique talents do they bring together? Uh, and then what drives our success? And this is where Todd was talking about the right metrics. What do you measure to know whether you're a successful organization or not? And it should be a simple formula. Uh, number of volunteers versus people served, something like that, a ratio. Uh, and then the last part is the discipline action. And I think here again, it's all about action, a culture of discipline and technology accelerators. And I won't go into details about that, but the idea that you stay relentlessly on the theme of what you're working on. You don't bounce around an everyday change. Now today we have to do that. I mean, we, you know, I, I met with uh, the reality of this a couple weeks ago, and I was talking to Michael. Uh, I can't say his last name. War is it from uh, Google? Head of Google in Ann Arbor. Lawrence. Oh, yeah. I, I think it's Mike. But uh, he was talking about strategic change. Yeah. Strategic, uh, Mike Miller, I'm sorry, Mike Moore is the filmmaker, Michael Miller. And he was talking about strategic planning for Google, and he said, well, we don't really do strategic planning here. And then I said, well, what, what, what do you mean? You know, he said, well, we can't, we don't know what's happening in the future. So, well, how can you say that? You've got to do like, three years, three years is too long. He said, let me give you an example. I've been in Ann Arbor for six years, Michael said. Uh, who was the leading company in telephones six years ago? Anybody want to answer? Nokia. Nokia and Blackberry. Okay. Uh, who was the uh, leading company in the, the world of innovation and television six years ago? Tebow. Okay. Who's, I don't know. Where's, where's Tebow today? Right. We all. And then, who was the chief competitor for got Google in six years ago? Yeah. yeah. So. How do you plan when there's that rapid of change? All those companies were flying high. Today we see companies flying high, but it's very, very hard. I think in the social sectors, we don't have that ability to change so quickly. So what are the like, technology accelerators that have to be adopted? So then defining success without business metrics. This is the key thing that I think uh, Mr. Collins talks about. We can't use business metrics which is basically financial return on investment, return to shareholders, to measure success in the social sectors. And those of you that I've been working with on this, we've talked about this. You've got success metrics that have to appeal to many different uh, constituencies. So he emphasizes the importance of calibrating success by focusing on outputs. 
And the idea is that when people give their money or their time, and that's all they have to give, money or time, they want to see what is what am I getting for this? Uh, you know, and you see those terrible old ads about you know the children in Biafra that are being adopted. You know, well that's an effective advertising because it says you give your money and a child gets milked in Biafra. You remember those from 30 years ago? But we, that's people are more sophisticated today. They want to see what happens. They want to see a great program that UMS puts on. Uh, if the sun is really bothering you, can you guys feel free to move? Uh, Love it. Yeah. Uh, that's not the sun. That's Ken's natural glow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Marvin got his job based on his great sense of humor. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, so contributors want to know how their money and time is making a difference, and it's important to assemble evidence. Again, this is what Todd is talking about. Qualitative or quantitative, which demonstrates three things. Superior performance, distinctive impact, and lasting endurance. And you could put those three in highlight because that's what people want to know. And they want hard data, but they also want stories. Uh, Steve Gill, and uh, James Stillwell have pioneered a, a method of evaluation which is about capturing the story. And that's about the passion, because people don't get real excited about uh, a number, 80%. It's like when George Carlin gave the baseball scores. And here are the baseball scores, 9 to 7, 14 to 3. It's hard to get emotionally charged up about those scores. You know, but if they say Tigers 7, Red Sox 3, you get charged up. So it's important, and this is again where using the media comes in. Uh, we have people in this town, extremely talented artists. Uh, uh, Christina Morales Hemingway in the back. Can you raise your hand, Christina? She's a, a filmmaker and uh, has come back to Ann Arbor from Hollywood because the sun was too much for her. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I like and glow. <laughs> yeah, but, but Christina and people like her, uh, Amy Milligan's another person right behind her, that are great at bringing the stories to life, either through video or through people talking uh, in, in audiences or drawings, but this is the emotional connection that I think we need to make a great story to get WCC people excited. What are the great stories about students who are graduating WCC and going on to uh, Michigan or Michigan State, you know, those kinds of things. So that's basically it, and if you look at the bottom, there's a great a, di a diagram on the bottom, it's in the back of the book, and to me it, it, it's really all about, number one, you have to attract believers to your cause if you're involved in the social sectors or not for profit, and believers can only give two ways. They can give of their time or they can give of their money. If there's a third way, let me know, uh, but I think those are the two, the three, the two main ones. And then you attract believers and you build strength. And you build strength in your organization by first who, then what, and also by clock building, which means has, you're not trying to do something quick and fast, but you're trying to do something enduring and lasting. And then when you build your team, you've, you've attracted your believers, you demonstrate results. And the results are demonstrated through the success of the mission and through trend lines. And we can talk more about what that means. And then you have to build a brand, uh, SOS, 42 years. But how many people in the community, when you say SOS, know what SOS does? How many of you knew what SOS does? Okay, only about a quarter. And it can be true for almost any uh, social service agency, and many of them sound the same. You know, the homeless this, homeless that. I mean, what, what is what? And if I want to get my time or money, how do I know where to go with that? Healthcare, you want to do something on providing healthcare. You want to do something providing for disabled youth, for special needs. It's very hard to differentiate uh, those different brands. And, and then there's also the reputation. And that's good and bad because uh, the reputation you build up over years and it can go away in a night, right? It can go away with a scandal and everything is uh, is trash. And we've seen this happen in social service agencies as in private businesses, but private businesses seem to be a little bit more enduring because they're not as based on people giving to those uh, organizations. 
So those are the principles to, to good to great in the social sectors. And the major contribution, again, from Jim Collins is that you cannot use business metrics. You have to use the other uh, ideas about uh, mission, about metrics, uh, and think differently. And I think, I just want to do a very quick little exercise. When you're a social service director, is there a director in the room or somebody who's close to the director? Okay. Katie, what do you, what's your, um, what's your organization? Also, okay. So when Katie has to think, I smell smoke, is that, is that okay? Or, it's good. It's good? Uh, I don't have to run out. <laughs> good smoke. Um, yeah. So uh, if I had to talk to Katie about her, how do you measure success, you've got many stakeholders. Can you just stand up for just a second? <laughs> so, who are some of the stakeholders that you have to think about when you think about what is success for Ozone? Well, of course, we think about the youth and families that we serve. We work with homeless and runaway youth and families. So, we, we think about um, our mission is to help youth lead safe, healthy, and productive lives. And so, we think about whether youth and their families are launching into adulthood safely uh, and healthily. So, that's our <coughs> um, constituent that we think about. Um, couldn't be here without the support of the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation uh, and the United Way and coordinated funders. So <laughs> we think about our funders, uh, we think about our donors, um, and we think about our staff. Yeah, that's four. Yes, and we think about the community and aligning with uh, community needs and community impact. All right. So there's five stakeholders that she just identified. I, I think you got them all. Is there any that we missed? Uh, good job. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you wake up in the morning, you think, I need to take care of all those five, and then you pull the covers back over and it's too much. <laughs> uh, and so that, that's the, those five are key. And all of you probably have been in all five of those positions. Certainly all of your members in the community. How, you, how many of you worked on a staff at the social service or not-for-profit or higher ed uh, in your lifetime? Has anybody not done that? Has anybody only worked in the private sector? I doubt it. I mean, I've, I've worked on many not-for-profits, some not intentionally. But, uh, I taught school, I've worked at universities, I've worked in mental health centers, which were uh, state-run uh, mental health centers, so we've all done that. And how many of you have been the recipient uh, of social service, or has a family member been the recipient of social service? Has anybody who not had a family member, or yourself personally, at one point, who has been uh, the recipient, or you wish had been available to be a recipient. Because I can think of some people in my family that did not have access to that and, uh, and suffered as a result. Uh, which, how many of you served on boards? Virtually everybody has served on a board. And, and how many of you are, have been or are directors of social service agencies or higher ed facilities? So, Again, you have to measure success with all of those. So what I'd like to do, we're gonna go through, I'm gonna have uh, Pam speak a little bit, and I'm gonna have Rose speak, and then Neil, about their perspectives on this from their different points of view. Uh, social service agencies, competing, uh, defining kind of the issues that, that Todd has had, and then uh, how it applies in higher ed, where it may not be the same, but there's still that same kind of uh, pressure to, uh, to, sh to show results and uh, we'll start off with Pam. Then. So Pam Smith who is the Executive Director of United Way, you say whatever you're comfortable with. <laughs> Good morning everyone, so I'm Pam Smith from United Way. When I heard Rob's opening remarks I was like, oh, I have never ridden on an elephant. <laughs> Dang it, what am I going to follow up with? But I think everybody in this room could certainly uh, could certainly feel themselves on top of a large beast taking a ride you didn't necessarily want to take through a rainstorm up a mountain and every one of us is probably held on tight right <laughs> so so in, a, in, a, in essence Rob you you have helped me out a little bit because I know a lot of us have probably ended up in that same puddle of water thinking what <laughs> my strategic plan, nor was it in the job interview. Uh, so, so, so here we are. We're leaders of uh, nonprofit agencies in our community, and we're really looking at ways 
to make sure that we remain viable and relevant. We want to make sure that we're delivering the services that we can to our community. And I think one of the most important things that stuck out for me in, in uh, good to great in social sectors was all about leadership. Leadership is really changing in, in, um, in the nonprofit world because like Katie was talking about, you have to answer to a lot of, uh, you have to answer to a lot of constituents. So you're not only talking to donors, you're not only looking at staff, volunteers, foundations, you're also looking at who else in the community has a stake in what you're doing. And when you look at that, when you, when you try to go to that answer, it's every single person, right? So every single one of us in this community matters. Every one of us has a stake in what happens tomorrow in our community. So we've talked a lot about different kinds of funding, um, and sequestration is talked about a lot. And a lot of us think, oh, that's Washington, that's DC, that's not affecting us. But in fact, because of that, 100 children aren't gonna get a Head Start slot, right? So picture, please, a 104-year-old in this room, all of a sudden with nowhere to go, without an education for tomorrow, and without a great start. We all know that brain development, brain development occurs in a very young age. We have to get those children off to a great start. But yet, some, something that happened far away is now affecting our children here in this community. So every one of us has a stake in what happens. Um, at United Way, we talked a little bit, or maybe Rob talked a little bit earlier, about um, measures. So how do we measure what we're doing? So at United Way, um, I'm sure that you've all heard about United Way, but um, we fund over 50 agencies in the community in trying to help increase um, the outcomes and the outputs that are in this community to help. Um, and we do it through a lot of different measures and metrics. So at United Way, we look at every agency that we fund to make sure, is there a board of directors? Is the board of directors active? Is there a 990? Is there a financial audit? What, what do they say they'll do? And, and we check to make sure that they're doing it because we have a responsibility to our donors because every dollar we give away isn't ours. It's not United Way's money. It's the community's money. It's the money that's been donated to United Way. It's come through you and you and you, right? A dollar at a time. Um, and a really interesting thing that that um, we do at United Way, that I, and I've only been here a year, so I can take no credit <laughs> for, for what's happened um, and, and all the good that they have done over the 90 years that they've been there. But we do board-to-board -board visits. So uh, myself, the Director of Community Impact, Doug Jackson, and a few of our board members will go to every single agency to one of their board meetings. So it really has opened and shed a lot of light on not only um, all of the networking and, and all of the cross kind of people that you see at, at different board meetings, but it lets us know, is their board informed? Does their board know what's going on? It gives them a chance to ask us questions about what's happening at United Way in the broader sense of the community. Um, so that's probably, it. it's time consuming, but it's been one of the most helpful things. And I can't begin to tell you how important it is about turning outward and about looking into the community and seeing what else is going on and making sure you're keeping your pulse. Like Rob said, things are changing at a rapid pace. And it allows us to have just one more window of opportunity to communicate and to see what's going on. What are the issues that that board is facing? So many times we'll hear, um, you know, well, I didn't know that that was happening. You know, so even board members that are concerned, involved volunteers sometimes don't know everything that's happening in their agency or in their community. And it really opened the door for a lot of great communication. It built stronger relationships, and I think that's what everybody has said. Um, right back to the person that started the company when she was two. Dang, I'm impressed. I want to talk to you later. Um, but it is, it is about people. Um, and we're lucky to have uh, great people in this community. Um, in a previous position, I worked in seven different counties and I was able to see how a lot of different counties operated and I was always grateful. Um, if you don't know this, Washtenaw County is one of only two out of all of the counties in Michigan that actually has a human service line in their budget. So we are a fortunate group of people. Um, that the city and the county actually recognizes the importance of human services because every time you help someone, 
they have a chance to become a taxpayer tomorrow, right? So, so many times people say, you know, these are different people. These are not different people. These are people that are your friends and your families and your neighbors. And sometimes one incident, one cancer diagnosis, one car accident, you're, you're one step away. A lot of families in this county are one step away from that kind of disaster and need help. Um, so being in Washtenaw County is a great place to be because we have the ability to help them. We have, gosh, I'm gonna meal, what, 800 nonprofits? Um, <laughs> so, so there is a lot of help here um, and we need to stay coordinated and we need to stay communicating to find out you know, about what all of that is. So I think Neil's going to talk a little bit later about coordinated funding. Um, it is a kind of, I don't know, it's a leading edge thing. It's not happening in very many places in the country where private and public sectors have come together to really look at um, what the community's needs are and coming together to state what they are and then work together to get to those. So I'm um, happy to answer more questions later, but I'll save time for everybody else. Oh, I am? Hi. Okay. Very nice seeing you today. Um, I'm shocked at the fact that I've never been here, so I will make sure <laughs> I'm at least breakfast. I would like to start with a story, because you talk about stories. And the other night, I was at Milan High School meeting parents and uh, for their open house. And after I gave a very brief presentation, a man came up to me and said, now I want to talk to you. And you know, when they start like that, you're thinking, oh my God, now what? And he said, every day when I pull out of my street, there's a billboard, and it's your billboard. And it says, what do you call a student or a person that went to Washtenaw Community College? And he said, and the word there is employed. And on that side, you have a picture of a welder. And I want you to know, that's my son. <laughs> you changed his life. He didn't know what he wanted to do, and he decided to go into welding. And um, so you do make an impact, and thank you. So that is a beautiful story, because his son is now working for Roush Industries. He told me that it's a job that he was placed in as a student at Washtenaw Community College. So we are, Washtenaw Community College is a community college. And, and that's a very comprehensive mission. Because our mission is about you. It's about a community. And we say that we are going to make a positive difference in people's lives through a full, accessible and quality education program. It doesn't say in college-bound students. It doesn't say in people who want training for a career. So we truly are your college from cradle to grave. Seriously. So at our college, you will see a co comprehensive array of programs. Our focus is on, first of all, meeting the community needs and through education and services. So if we talk about accessible, remember I said accessible? I think when that mission was written, probably, I don't know, 20, what do you think, 20, 30 years, Steve? Steve's on my board. Uh, yeah, from, Long time. from the beginning, 40 years ago. 40 years ago. Let's just talk about the word accessible. Because then we're going to talk about everything else that we just talked about. Accessible, what does that mean? 40 years ago, accessible meant, can you afford it? That's what accessible meant. That's it. Do you have transportation? Maybe. That's what it meant. What does accessible now mean to a community member that may want to go to school? It still is, can I afford it? But now it's, does it fit into my schedule? Because now people don't come to school based on your schedule. And so what does that mean? Is it online? Do I have access to it online? 
do I have access to it on ground because I don't like this online stuff? And I, I can't come 15 weeks. Are you kidding me? I can't do this. I have to go out and, you know, I have to go to work. I have to get done with this whole four-year degree in like two or three. So I can't do 15. I can only do six at a time or seven at a time. Oh, and by the way, they're quality. I want quality programming. Quality. Because you need to meet my needs. And by the way, if you don't give it to me, I like you and everything, but I'm shopping around. I'm shopping around. That's what accessible means to us today. So what do you do? That's your new mission. And now you have the staff that has been working there close to 40 years, some. You have, you know, a mindset of what accessible meant, because it takes a long time. Let's, I mean, you know, I'm a college president. I've been training for this job since kindergarten. I mean, most of us in education have been doing this for a very long time. So, you know, we have our mindset. You know, I, I, you know, I know what education is supposed to be like. So you're dealing with a staff like that. So you talk about change, and you talk about the need for resources and the need for bringing in training. You talked about the needs that are different now in in board members, the needs that are different in your staff members. How do you teach people how to teach online if they don't even want to? How do you help put their curriculum online? And how do you tell a whole community, we can, offer, we can do it any way you want it. You want it for 15 weeks? We can give it to you for 15 weeks. And then let's talk about the hedgehog concept. It's very true, what are we good at? You know what we're good at? We are good at teaching. We are good at delivering quality programming. And we are good at making an economic impact on this community. So that is what we are very good at. How do we know? Because we measure that. And that's what we will report back to you. Kind of like the Steve Gill concept of this is something new getting. But you'll notice this is about stories, but you're going to see data on the economic <coughs> impact that we make from a student or to a community that has this. We offer classes that are available to people for free. Did you know that? If you're over 65, I think, you can come, 65, 70, 60? I didn't think that was old. <laughs> oh my God, you want to talk about an economic model that's changing. I mean, holy cow, we have 60. So, um, I mean, we offer them for free. So, I mean, that's how we give back. You know, health and fitness center, that's how we give back. So, what kind of team do you need to lead this kind of institution? It's different than a team that you needed five years ago. It is. Because now you need to know, you have to have someone who can figure all this out. And who can make it look very seamless to the outside. You need, even though we don't report on metrics, financial metrics, how in the world are you going to do this if you don't have the money? You can no longer rely on state or federal funding. Property taxes, if it passes in um, what, when it's up in November, I think we'll cut our funding from $600,000 to $1.3 million. Um, so you can't rely on that source. You can't keep raising tuition because that's not what the point is. And because we are a cure for this community. So we have to figure out how to bring in resources. Resources that can keep our mission alive the way you want it. So how do you do that? Well, we use our resources, we use what we're good at. So when we talk about that, you know, looking at what we're good at for this head hodge, head hodge audit concept, and thinking about what, and what we're good at is teaching and learning, because we are a teaching and learning institution. But clearly, in this same mission that was written 40 years ago, these people were brilliant. They said that we were gonna be the per premier career and technical college for the county. What, and remember the guy's story about pulling out of his park driveway and seeing our sign? So what are we good at? One of our, three years in a row, we're good at a lot of things, but I'm gonna talk about how to get resources based on what you're good at so you don't dilute your mission. Three years ago, 
we, I mean, for three years now, we've placed in the uh, top two positions in worldwide competition in welding. This is huge. So I don't even know if you know this about our college, but we are partners with the United Association of Plumbers and Pipe Fitters. Let me tell you about them. They have 280,000 members in the United States. They have 60 members in Canada. And we just signed a new agreement two years ago with Australia for 30,000 members. We are their exclusive training provider. How do we do that? We offer it online, on ground, any way they want it. That brings in increased revenue. How do we make them happy? Well, when they're here for one month, uh, one week only, because all the rest is done online, we partner with the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation, I mean, uh, Area Convention Bureau and the Solani Convention Bureau. And we are bringing business that one week to all the restaurants, the hotels, and all the businesses that are in our area. That brings you, our community, because we care about our economic impact. That promotes what we're very good at throughout the world. And it also brings in the resources we need to add to the resources that you give us. So those are, and by the way, they just asked for a 10-year renewal. Isn't that exciting? So that's great. That's just a brief synopsis, but um, anytime you want to talk about how we can work with you, because we work with business, we work with nonprofits, we work with everyone, just let us know. Thank you. But sometimes we have to say no. But that's part of that hedge and talk concept, right? That's right. <laughs> that's all right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, okay, I can hear myself. That's a good sign. So. Um, I want to talk a little bit uh, more specifically about good to great and some of Colin's lessons. And what I'm hoping you'll walk away with is actually some, some practical insight on what's happening in the local nonprofit sector that you might not be aware of, but that's hitting the sector like a freight train. And actually advice for you as trustees of nonprofits, because I know a lot of you in the room are, are nonprofits. Um, one of the things that excited the nonprofit sector about Colin's uh, monograph uh, about the social sector was the idea that measurement is important but not in the traditional for-profit sense. Um, so uh, a lot of people interpret columns differently, but what he really said was measure. By golly, you will measure, but it's not just the quantitative outputs that are traditional in the for-profit sector. The qualitative matters and the assembly of evidence really matters. So I wanted to tell you, uh, just to give you an example of that from a prior position I had as CEO of the New Center up on North Main. Um, we really embraced that. I remember this uh, after the Collins piece came out. Um, we reported to our board every month um, some clear measurables, and that included customer acquisition, because we were in the uh, sales business to a certain extent, revenues, people served, and all that, so they had a sheet of those traditional for-profit metrics. Um, but they also had, preceding that, a one-pager of what we called mission moments, which were three to four sentences, and probably five or six instances on a page, of qualitative descriptions of the kinds of impacts we were making on other nonprofit organizations because our mission was to help other nonprofits succeed. And you can't just measure that through through core financial or other business uh, metrics. And so what we tried to do was really teach our board that the overall impact we were having was a pairing of the qualitative considerations of what makes a great nonprofit plus the quantitative of sort of the evidence of the work that we we're doing, the quality outputs that we were having. So as a trustee, what I'd really implore all of you to do is one, insist on measurement in your board packets, in your conversations with your fellow trustees, in your conversations with the executive staff of your organizations. It's not okay to say that, no, we can't measure, we can't capture what greatness is. You can, there's proxies for all these things. But as a board member, it's also your responsibility to make sure that you widen your horizons beyond what, for most of you, is a profit lens and mindset, that it's more than just the quantitative, that you have to find a way to embrace the quantitative, uh, qualitative and make that a part of the conversation that you pair the two. Um, another really exciting point in, in Collins' piece, and this is both his book and his monograph, was the importance of leadership. And of course, we all agree with that, right? 
Um, one thing I want to try to explain to you is why leadership is, I would, I would say, more challenging in the nonprofit sector than the, the counterparts in the for-profit sector. I come from a for-profit background, um, uh, uh, a small company called Ford Motor Company, um, and uh, and I will tell you, so 300,000 plus employees while I was there, we had one common goal, right? It was profit or loss, right? And, and let's say shareholder value as well. Um, and it was a unifying theme across the, the country, across the globe. It made it very easy for us to make decisions across thousands of employees because it was that one unifying goal. Let's all make money. Nothing wrong with that. I, in fact, it was great. It was great to have one goal. When I made the jump to the nonprofit sector, I realized just how much more complex Katie's job was compared to a similar sized company in the for-profit world because Katie actually has a more important bottom line. Her, her profit loss bottom line, her financial bottom line, absolutely, I, I, and I agree with Dr. Belanca, you gotta have the money to do the work, right? But Katie's job isn't done there. She can have a terrific financial year, and I can still look at Katie and say, Katie, what, what kind of impact did you actually make on the teens and other youth that you're serving? I, I, I don't see the impact. So Katie's job is actually twofold. It's to make sure that the organization is run financially sound, and that yes, it's making a profit. Nonprofits should be making profits. But secondly, and more important, she's accountable to the mission of her organization, and that's a separate bottom line. And that's the one that matters. And so every nonprofit leader I work with, I am so sympathetic to the challenge that they have, because some folks are coming at them from the financial standpoint, why aren't you raising more money, and, and why aren't you making more money? And others are saying, are you really achieving your mission? Are you really making an impact on the community? And Collins really highlighted this, so I want to give you an example of how we view this at the Community Foundation. To us, uh, we see ourselves as an investor in many organizations. Leadership is one of the greatest controls on risk as an investor. If you ask me what factors we look at when we make an investment in an organization, of course we look at some financials, but one of the first things we look at is the quality of executive leadership at the organization because of that double bottom line. It's not enough to have a great staff and a great CFO. What they really need is a leader with vision and the ability to pull all these different constituents together. It's sort of like being the Pied Piper, right? There is no command and control in the nonprofit world, believe me. Um, you're pulling together your board, your staff, your donors, the community and concerned citizens, the government, all those pieces, and that's a daily, that's a daily process, right? And, and, and I think Ken can attest to, uh, um, it's not about the finances. And sure, you know, revenues mean ticket sales, mean interest by the community. So there's a crossover, but how do you measure greatness, right? For great performance. And how do you measure the feeding of the soul for a community? And the answer is, is it's complicated. Um, and so uh, from our perspective, when we look at any investment, it's the impact we can make on the community. And in terms of minimizing the risk of our investment and making sure that our donors' money are put to work effectively, it's looking at the leadership of an organization. You should all sort of look at nonprofits that way. And it's not just about a leader, right? It's not, the world doesn't begin and end with the CEO. But on the nonprofit side, I've been surprised at just how critical and important that role is to an effective organization. And I think more so than on the for profit side. The last point I'll make is. Um, uh, a, a trend that's happening that a lot of folks aren't aware of yet, but it is radically transforming, especially the health and human uh, service sector uh, locally. Um, and so I'm gonna take that leadership concept that was already complicated, and, I, and I'm gonna add a layer, and that's networked leadership. It's a whole different set of skills. And funders like the United Way and like the Community Foundation, we're starting to insist on network leadership. And what do we mean by that? Well, the first thing we mean is we're not holding others to a different standard. We're telling ourselves as funders, you know what, money's fungible, so why aren't we working more closely together? Why aren't we sharing goals? Why aren't we bringing on the same outcomes? And why does Katie have to write four different applications to four different funders for the same goal and the same impact? So uh, that's where a concept called coordinated funding has come through. Uh, it's three years in, some of you know a lot about it, so forgive me if I, if I bore you with a quick uh, summary. The United Way, the Community Foundation, the City of Ann Arbor, Washtenaw County, and a fifth public funder called the Washtenaw Urban County, which is a HUD district, we've all agreed to come up with shared outcomes and goals and have a shared process for organizations to access our funds to meet those goals. And that is a profoundly different way of supporting the community through our funding institutions. And yeah, can I ask you, Paul, to just say sure, that one more time? It's really important. Sure. Uh, <laughs> five funders, three public and two private, 
have all adopted the same set of shared outcomes for human services in Washtenaw County. I could go into a lot more detail. I won't bore you with the details now. Talk to me later if you want, or, or to Pam, or to Dr. Balanca, uh, or to Todd, because they're all involved in this as well. Um, these five funders have adopted shared goals, and as well as shared processes for distributing monies to invest in those goals. And so part of the, the part of the goal is to actually make Katie's job easier, is she doesn't have to go to multiple funders for the same for, uh, for the same request. It's a single process. But just as important is getting all of us funders on the same page as to what we're working towards together. Because obviously, uh, working together is more effective than working working separately. So we're starting with the idea that we as funders, as funders, have to actually learn how to be network leaders. And that's not easy. I mean, it's been a really steep learning curve for all of us. Uh, funders tend to be islands unto themselves. Uh, this is the way the cultures work. And so for us to, you know, not two days go by where I'm not working with Pam or her staff very uh, closely on issues. And five years ago, that wasn't the case. So first of it's sort of that physician heal thyself type of philosophy, right? As the funders have to learn how to be network leaders themselves. But then we're insisting on the same approach among nonprofits. It's not good enough anymore for Ozone House to be doing a great job in their slice of what they serve. They need to be working with other agencies that touch on the same clients. They need to be working with other agencies that are sort of the handoffs before uh, teenage years or, or afterwards and workforce development and that sort of thing. We're investing in a whole new layer, and it, some could call it bureaucracy, but we call it sort of greater network and coordination, uh, coordinated effort. We're investing in a layer that specifically is trying to create uh, more collaboration and more networked thinking among agencies in the same place. So for example, uh, agencies that serve seniors. Um, uh, there are many of them, they all do great work, but there's not enough conversation among them about what about the bigger picture. Uh, in Washtenaw County. Who is the most vulnerable target uh, uh, population? And what do we mean when we talk about aging gracefully in place? We're starting to get agencies to think more together on what that means. And as a result, I'll tell you what that what, what the result will be. It will be better outcomes for the people we serve, going right back to what Todd talked about. The end client who we ultimately serve will be best served in a network environment. The reason I talk about all this is because this is hard. Okay, Katie has a limited budget and uh, a staff that's already working their tails off, and now we're telling her, and guess what, Katie, you also have to network with others and be a co-leader with other agencies who may have a different mission, a different operational philosophy, uh, and a different outlook. And so uh, I'll, I'll be the first to admit the pressures we're putting on ourselves and on nonprofit agencies is greater than ever, but I'll, I'll tell you, it's a new chapter in this community, and if you fast forward a couple years to coordinated funding, what you're gonna find is a much tighter relationship among funders, and we want to get other funders involved as well, and a much tighter and coordinated relationship among nonprofits. Um, and this stuff isn't easy, it comes at a cost, it's why I love the Collins piece so much, is he really focuses on leadership. Without the great leaders, this is impossible, so we're lucky that we already have some of the base infrastructure, if you will. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just stop right there. Do we need a round of applause for you? <laughs> Volunteers and, and money for Katie. <laughs> even better than before. So there's a, a lot that's been said here, and I look around the room and I realize many other uh, agencies and institutes and uh, individuals are very much involved in this. But I'd like to uh, have an opportunity. I know some of you have to go. We're going to probably carry this conversation on until nine. If you have to leave a little bit early, normally we wrap up at 8.45, that's fine. But let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, who has the first burning question for the panel that uh, either would like to ask a question or share a story that's maybe triggered by this? Hey, Michael Samuels. Well, first of all, I have so many... Just introduce yourself to Oh, Michael Samuels, and I'm actually the executive director of the Health and Wellness Alliance for Children in Dallas, Texas. So that's a long story, but <laughs> I'm from here. I have a comment, first of all, Washington College Community College was so important to me. 42 years ago, I got out of the military. It was Vietnam. I got my jump started at Washington Community College. Went on to Eastern for my undergraduate, Michigan for my graduate, now I lecture at the University of Michigan. But Washington Community College was so important to jumpstart people when they're young kids. So I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you. 
other Wait, questions. Can I tell you one quick story, Rob, yeah. about a welder? So, um, <laughs> about 30 years ago, I fell in love and married a guy, and my mom goes, oh, well, you know, what does he do? And I'm like, oh, he's a welder. And um, she said, well, I bet you he's a hard worker, you know, and gave me your blessing and went off. So my husband today holds uh, four patents, works for a tech transfer company with the University of Michigan. So important starts. If people feel successful when they're young, they, they, they walk through life thinking they can do anything. So Washington Community College is a gem. Thank you. So just, just my dad used to teach welding at Washington. <laughs> I have a question, uh, as a, uh, I guess welding is quite a bond. <laughs> Would somebody like to escort Marvin out? Uh, so, I have a question. Uh, I was shocked by 800 not-for-profits in the county. And as a uh, individual who's lived in Ann Arbor for over 40 years, how the hell do people figure out what to get involved and what resources are out there to educate uh, people to help them figure out what's what? Uh, because we're almost an embarrassment of wealth, of you know, uh, resources in the community. So that's the question. I don't know who would like to answer that, Pam. So just to put your mind at ease, the first thing that funders do when somebody comes to them with a new idea for a five, you know, a five hundred one c three, we want to be a nonprofit, is we really take some time to talk to them about is it a program that could work at an existing nonprofit. So the answer isn't always to start your own nonprofit. Is how can we strengthen other nonprofits? And just to your point, if people really do want. Um, a lot of data and they want to know exactly kind of the heartbeat of the county. If you go to United Way's um, website, uwgive.org, there's a data portal that was assembled through our coordinated funding partners. So um, the five people or the five agencies that Neil talked about all came together to put together a data portal. And it'll give you up-to-date facts and figures on everything from homelessness to seniors to um, health, uh, safety net health, early childhood education, school-aged youth, and housing and homelessness. So those are all up-to-date figures. Um, our elected officials have been using it a lot, um, so it's really a good resource if you do want to know. And Kim, can you explain, can you give to United Way, the United Way campaign, that's a way of distributing your donation. Can you explain that? I mean, it's maybe simple for people, but. Sure, yep. So um, United Way um, is, uh, is an agency that collects funds to do good work in the community. Um, so we do have specific things that we work in. So we are a health and human service agency, um, but we do run a campaign, a workplace campaign, so what most of you know about, um, and you can designate to any 501c3. So we do check, we make sure that, you know, it's all in the up and up, that they have all of that stuff in place. Um, but it's an opportunity for you to become involved in your community, it, it, um, if you look at us as a philanthropic advisor of sorts, um, we will make sure that you get the return on investment, whether you designate or whether you give a dollar a week or whether you give substantially more than that. Um, so it's just a great opportunity and it opens the door for a lot of people to be able to be part of something bigger and be part of the solution. Let me just add, so a lot of people ask why there's so many nonprofits in Washington County. So think of the nonprofit sector as private action for public good. So anyone who can generate the revenue to, to engage in activities has the opportunity to run a nonprofit. Now, we don't want to go to the other extreme, which is sort of a single agency doing it all, because that's called government, actually. We already have one of those. And so to a certain extent, diversity is important in the nonprofit sector. When you get frustrated about how many nonprofits there are, first thing you've got to ask yourself is, are you contributing to the problem? Do you have your causes and, and, and your uh, uh, that, that that you invested with your own money. Uh, and then just know, actually as funders, we are trying to work on this issue. We're not gonna come down and tell nonprofits, hey, it's time, although maybe that day will come in the right circumstances. What we try to do is incentivize organizations to work more closely with each other. So for the past few years, we've been putting up money specifically to fund shared operations and shared back office work among nonprofits. We believe that will actually yield organic mergers uh, among agencies, but we think it'll be the right way where we respect the autonomy and independence of nonprofits, but give them incentives to work with each other, where right now, frankly, the financial incentives aren't there. Can you guys address 
the whole Detroit issue and how Washtenaw County, and, you know, I think a lot of people feel they want to get involved somehow in helping to try to know Ferris is here from Wayne State to two other people, but I mean, we, we sit here and we talk about the embarrassment of wealth and then just down the road is the embarrassment of, of a work much terrible source. So can you just talk about how you guys think about what's going on in the county and how we can uh, understand it? You know, how we can help in Detroit through strengthening our, I don't that's a good question, it's a big elephant in the room, so to speak. Well, okay, so first of all, it's not a zero-sum game. Let's let's just get that on the table. There, there's, um, uh, if, if you believe in, in the region and you believe in local, give support to both. And I know so many people and so many corporations that do that. Um, I'm not completely convinced that as goes Detroit, as goes the region is, is what, I, what I hear a lot because I think 30 years of evidence shows that that's not the case. Um, uh, that said, I, I did do work in Detroit for a couple of years. The need there is great. There's no question about that. What I will tell you is Detroit's become a great crucible for new ideas and experiments. And some of what's going on in Detroit, whether it's urban farming uh, or renewal of certain areas, absolutely applies to Washtenaw County. There's two zip codes in Ypsilanti where the demographics of need are very, very close to what's in Detroit. And so believe me, we're actually speaking with agencies. At the funder level, we go to Southeast Michigan uh, conferences where we're learning a lot from, about what's going on in Detroit and we're helping that to inform the kind of work that we do. Likewise, um, I know that the exchange of information uh, goes the other way as well, as some of what's going on in Washtenaw County uh, does benefit and, and, uh, and impact uh, the Detroit community as well. I, I just wanted to say I think the hedgehog, the idea for uh, Good to Great, would be worthwhile for us to do it for Michigan. Uh, and uh, many of you, uh, I know a few of us know Rick Snyder not well enough to get this going, but you think about for the state, I mean, we're not really a county. We are, I grew up in, in uh, Oakland County. I, I grew up in Detroit. You know, I didn't necessarily, Detroit is the region. When, when I tell people in Asia where I'm from, they don't identify with the University of Michigan, sorry, but they say Detroit, oh yeah, I get that. So I think the hedgehog, what are we world class at? And I think engineering, me, is what we do best, you know, engineering and, and that kind of engineering innovation. So I think if we could do more about this hedgehog idea for the region, the whole state, we might be able to brand ourselves better because this is still a challenge to try to brand at the very small level of what you're doing, of one home on Washington, how many, how many kids do you uh, touch a year? A couple thousand. A couple thousand, wow, that's pretty good. I wouldn't have guessed that. I would say hundreds. But these uh, these apply also at the, the county level, at the city level, at the, uh, the state level. So we need to be thinking big as well as small when we talk about these things. I also want to applaud an effort that's been going on here. I don't think anybody's in the room, but we've had presentations on uh, health care and trying to make health care affordable for everybody in the uh, in this, the county. And uh, I wonder if some of you can give us an update on that. And I know it's been a tough ride in the legislature uh, to get uh, on board with health care, but I applaud the efforts the governor has made lately to get that through. But can you talk about the, uh, the health care reform and what's happening there to get health care for uh, all people in Michigan? So, yeah, I'll talk about Washington County. Okay. That's what I uh, so the Washtenaw Health Initiative is a collaboration of all of the local um, medical doctors, hospitals. It was started by Bob Laverty, Marion Udall Phillips, Bob Gunzel, a former county administrator, and Doug Strong, the head of U of M Health Systems. So, Norman Herbert, too, I think. And Norman Herbert, right. So five, sorry. Um, and so they got together and brought together everybody to the table and it is an amazing collection of people because they realized years ago probably two or three years ago that when and if this passed over 15,000 people in washington county alone would become eligible for services so what does that mean do we have people in place to enroll those people do we have doctors ready to take those people on the primary health care physicians are there medical homes for all those people? What about the people that don't speak English? Um, so there was just, you know, do we have do we have translators in place? Do you know the form is 27 pages long? What if you have a literacy problem? So thanks to the wealth of 
knowledge and, and forethought and just kind of really innovative thinking. They've been working on it. And to see the progress over the last couple of years is just amazing as far as what's in place. Uh, last week we had over 50 people come in to talk to find out more about the Affordable Health Care Act and to be volunteers to help sign all of these people up. The hospitals are at a whole new level of communication. Um, I remember about a month ago, we were at Washington Community College, thank you Rose, um, and um, two physicians, one from U of M and one from St. Joe's were, were on the panel and they were saying, we can now look at each other's records. That would have never happened years ago. And what does that mean? That means the person that doesn't have health care that shows up at one ER and gets a series of tests doesn't turn around and have the same test done at the other hospital, right? Because they know they're communicating now. So there's a lot of good things happening. Um, CHART from the University of Michigan is kind of organizes all of Washington Health Initiative. They provide the staff support. So I would urge you, if you want to know more about what's happening, to go on their website. They have a tremendous amount of information. Um, but it's really something to be proud of in Washington County. All right, we're going to a couple questions. Uh, Steve, Dante, and then uh, any other? Yeah, and, uh, Ferris. Okay, so uh, let's start. We got lots of questions. So, Steve, you want to? Well, I'm gonna put Rose on the spot again. Uh, we're talking about healthcare. Maybe just a couple words about pilot colleges responding to healthcare needs. In the Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, we're we're very active. Actually, we sat down with all the healthcare providers here, with the CEOs of the hospitals. Um, the uh, different homes or facilities and ask them what do you see yourself needing in three to five years because everything is changing and the, uh, you know so what they told us and we asked the CEOs because the CEOs know what's coming rather than someone on the floor and they told us exactly what they're expecting and so what we are doing Actually, we hired Kathleen Griffiths. Do you know who she is? She was the CEO of Chelsea Hospital. Um, and so when she retired, we took her out of retirement. And she is our connection with all of the hospitals and healthcare providers so that we can develop the programs um, that the hospitals need and the up-to-date curriculum for that. And they are already assuring us job placement in those areas. So what we're doing now as a college, and I'm so glad you mentioned it because it's in a few other sectors as well, is we're working with the end in mind and working right with the employer and saying, what is it you need? And we will help train that. But we're, of course, we're, you know, they go on for four-year degrees also. I mean, most of the, everything we do, it's not a dead end. So it's like a career pathway. So you can come in and take a short-term class. I mean, there's even something called a medical transporter. Do you know what that is? It's the person that I thought was a candy striper or a retired person that puts someone on the cart, you know, or puts them in a wheelchair. Well, now because of the insurance requirements in the hospitals, they have to be certified. And so it's even training something one like that. But isn't that a great short-term job? Because you can get that and then go on and become whatever else you want to be, a nurse, you can go get your degree. So thank you for asking. Now, I'm looking at my clock and I realize it's, it's almost nine and I know a lot of people have a hard stop. So I'm gonna to have to hold the questions. I just again want to thank everybody for coming. And I'd like to say that you know, the CEO Connect, I'm very interested in getting something for the nonprofit sector, uh, social sector like this that would meet once a month, and I'd be happy to help coordinate that. I don't have the resources just working for myself to get it started, but if any of you uh, would like to talk to me about ways that we might be able to get this going, to bring in quality speakers around leadership uh, for the people that 800 or so, more than that, uh, leaders in the community that are leading not for profits, uh, it would be great to do that. The other thing is, uh, again, on uh, the 27th, uh, we're going to have Cheryl Choden back here, and then uh, we're really honored to have Lloyd Carr as our speaker in October, October 26th, and he's going to do that. He's a big supporter of United Way, and it's going to be a benefit for the United Way. We don't charge for these events, uh, but I think today, also, if you want to make a contribution uh, in, in even cash or whatever, check, uh, 
to uh, United Way, that would be a great way to show your uh, support. Or, Ozo. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Since we put Katie on the spot. And, uh, Dante, I know you're dying for... It's not a question. It's, okay. a it's a comment from the group. Actually. Okay. Yeah, so half a minute. Uh, my name is Dante Vasquez. I'm a student here at Ross. I'm a member of the Community Consulting Club, and we offer free consulting services to nonprofits in the area. So every semester, about a dozen nonprofits will pour, uh, you know, approach our group with a question, uh, business question, we form teams of MBAs and uh, take the semester to work on it. As an example, we worked, uh, I worked with uh, uh, Nichols Arboretum and the Botanical Gardens this last semester, uh, working on a pricing strategy for them. Um, so uh, I, th I think it's a great resource for, for some of the nonprofits. Get some free consulting services. If you're interested, let me know. Dante, what's your uh, email? Uh, it's vasquezd at umich. Put it on the website. Vasquez D. And uh, Roger, this again, we thank Roger for video. This will, usually it's up within uh, a few days. Right? So, uh, the, uh, the past events are up, and Roger, uh, it's a great resource, so this may be a good training tape uh, to show some of your staff, uh, some of your donors. I mean, it's really great to frame uh, this whole concept, and uh, Neil and I have talked about maybe even offering uh, a workshop, a more intense workshop for a, a wider variety of people on good to great in the social sector. So if there's some interest, please email me about that and I'll put it together a list and see if we might have the uh, energy to put something on for your staffs uh, around this, this concept. I know there are a couple people in here. We actually have somebody from Gross Point today who's uh, here and working on the same concept and several other uh, agencies are, are, are utilizing it, so it's a great way. One of the things I just take away is that we're really moving from competition to collaboration, and that is so great. It's really a different model. Uh, I also think of it as a way we're moving sort of from that toxic masculinity model of leadership to more of a collaborative feminine model, if you will. I hate to use those words, but I think it is happening, and uh, I think it's a, it's a good thing for all of us. So uh, thank you for your participation. Feel free to hang around, bring food back. We don't want to leave any on the table. We'll see you later in the month.